too. All right. We're here at uh, this session of Rebase. Rebase is a conference to bring people from the industry to uh, closer to people working in the in the academy. Today, we are very lucky to have Dave Abrams, who will talk about Swift here. I've had the privilege to work with Dave on multiple value semantics. It's a thing that I'm sure will be uh, discussed in the context of the Swift programming language. Dave has worked, has been a, a big contributor in the C++ world, worked with Boost, moved to Apple, developed Swift over there. He's also known for developing the Swift UI library that is used in all iPhones today. Moved to uh, Google for some time, worked uh, on machine learning, and is now a principal scientist at uh, Adobe. And he will be discussing after this talk with two uh, other people who were uh, nice enough to, to join this conversation. Roman Elizabeth, who is the lead developer on the Kotlin programming language at JetBrains, and Dennis Shabalin, who is a researcher at Google working on machine learning, who I've been lucky enough also to, to collaborate with in the context of, of Swift. So the format will be 30 to 40 minutes presentation from Dave, followed by a discussion after with the audience. I will be keeping a close eye on the uh, chats on the Zoom meeting, as well as the Discord. So feel free to ask any question and uh, I will try to forward them to Dave as we go along. So without any further ado, I think we can start. Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dimitri, for that very nice introduction. Uh, it saves me having to improvise a long rambling story about myself. I am honored to work now at Adobe as a principal scientist at, in the software technology lab with Sean Parent, who is listening in here. Basically, the good the good stuff is at the end. You know, it'll be we'll have a free form discussion with Roman, Denis, and myself, and I th I think we can let people jump into that. Right, good. So so it's my job to fill up some some space here before we get get started with that, give you a little bit of a, the background information. And I've got this kind of ramshackle collection of slides. I'm not sure if we will get through them all before uh, 30 to 40 minutes is, is up. We'll, we'll play it by ear. I do want to say by way of introduction about my background, I got into this whole deep involvement with programming languages, mostly due to discovering the standard template library of C++ uh, and discovering that it didn't have exception safety. Nobody really had figured out how to handle errors there. And I was uh, foolish enough to send a message to Alex Stepanov and say, you know, I think I know how to solve this. Can we do something? And he said, well, you have to go talk to the committee and, and they're very busy and they're behind schedule and nothing's going to happen. But this started, launched me on a long, many year journey through involvement with language design and library design that started with the C++ committee. So all of you language purists can tune me out right now because that's my background. I came into uh, all of the formal work through C++, but I think it has served me well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the goals we had in creating Swift the bullets are out of order. So uh, <laughs> then we'll talk about some of the things that are unique or unusual about Swift. I will go over a uh, sort of timeline of Swift development since the 1.0 release and talk about some of the challenges we faced. Then we get to the good stuff. Please do feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have questions. So to understand the goals of Swift, you kind of have to have some sense of the language that it was designed to replace. And that is Objective-C. And I don't know how many of you know Objective-C. I think if you haven't been programming for Apple platforms for quite a few years, it's probably a pretty esoteric language. Basically, Objective-C was standard C with strict extensions that uh, gave it kind of more of a small talk like object-oriented programming flavor. And in 1981, if you wanted to use C code, but you also wanted object-oriented programming and you were ready to hack your compiler, this is kind of where you might end up. 
it evolved a bit since then, but the the basics all pretty straightforward. The object oriented programming, it's dynamic and the sense of small talk in Python methods are looked up by the moral equivalent of their name. It's called a selector, but it's effectively the method name. Well, I don't know, I, I have it listed as a minus. Some people loved that, but uh, it had some costs. But one of the huge benefits that it had was that it was very easy for the vendors of the system frameworks to evolve their libraries. So they could add new stored properties to their, to their classes, add new methods and not break any existing software. And when you, if you've programmed on Apple platforms, when you write a program for say iOS, you actually tell it which versions of iOS, you tell the development environment, which versions of iOS you're targeting, including older ones and how far back you, you expect to run. The whole system, the whole ecosystem is designed so that they can upgrade the operating system for many years without breaking your program. Um, so that was sort of a really important feature. So class instances were dynamically allocated as you might expect and reference counted. Of course, because this is based on, on standard C, it inherits all the weaknesses of C, including you know the, the preprocessor, those awful macros, the include model, the lack of, of interesting namespace nesting, right? So in fact, you know, the standard practice with objective C was always to add two or three letter uh, unique prefixes to, to all of your components in order to distinguish what library they were a part of. Also, of course, you know, you get all of the undefined behavior of C if you touch any of the C types and you are still gonna use integers and pointers and all the standard C types. So here's roughly what some objective C looks like. I, I kind of wrote out the uh, simplest class definition that you might imagine. There's a header file with an interface definition there on the left. On the right, you see the implementation file, which they use a .m extension for unknown reasons. And uh, at the bottom is what your your main program might look like. So, so you see that's just that's just C until you get to the square brackets, and the square brackets are Smalltalk inspired method invocation syntax. So I'm going to move the main off the screen and just show you the interface and implementation next to each other so that you can see the corresponding parts. So at the top, the brace enclosed part you have there on the left are the stored properties and for whatever reason, I don't know why the, those are end up in the header files because they're not part of the interface. Those are actually private to the implementation, but that's the way Objective-C is. And these things with the dashes in front of them are methods. If you look at the init method, that's a, you have to read it sort of with C syntax. So it starts with the return type. The init method returns an integer, integer star and it takes, a, an int argument that is called value. Over on the right, you can see the implementation of that. It's just assigning value into self's value. So self is the, the receiver in, in Objective-C um, and it returns self. So that's this ends up being useful for, for chaining of methods. That's the, that's the idiom there. So get value is a method that just returns an int right, it returns that stored value. And then you can see an implementation of plus. So plus, if you look at plus, you can start to see some of the syntactic qualities of Objective-C. Now, now maybe we should look at, at main for that. I may not have a good example of it. So if we go back and look at main, you can see that you have on either side of the word plus, at the bottom here, you have the construction of, a, of an object. So this is integer four plus integer three. And this was one of the valued properties of Objective-C for the community that used it was this ability to get this kind of infix uh, name notation. We add those two together, we 
we call get value, the get value method on, on the result. And we're printing that out as an int. Okay, onward. Okay, a little bit about the value system among Objective-C programmers. This comes from the Wikipedia page for Objective-C. So it says, object-oriented programming in the simulus style, which is not what Objective-C is, um, forces all methods to have a corresponding implementation unless they're abstract. The small talk style programming as used in Objective-C, it, it allows messages to go unimplemented with the method resolved to its implementation at runtime. For example, a message may be sent to a collection of objects and only some will be expected to respond without fear of producing runtime errors. Message passing also does not require that an object be even defined at compile time. Also, if messages are sent to nil, they will be silently ignored. This was the Kool-Aid, okay? So for me and the, those of us who were developing Swift, we could see the cost of this was that it was, you know, hiding all kinds of bugs in code. Uh, code would silently sort of seem to work um, and you would miss where the actual failures were. But this kind of relaxed dynamism was part of the cultural appeal of Objective-C to the community that used it. So another, another issue about Objective-C was this dynamic method lookup by name that we discussed earlier. This is a, a blog post about bypassing Objective-C message send, which is, the, which is the, essentially the dispatcher for looking up methods. Uh, in Objective-C and it says on the fastest path, it can transfer execution to an implementation in just over a dozen instructions, which is great most of the time, right? Most of the time method calls are, you know, actually doing the, the method call is not on your critical path, but sometimes it is. And one of the things that had become more and more important to Apple at the time when I started there was the battery life of mobile devices. You really couldn't afford to be spending 12 cycles in the best case to uh, get to a, a method implementation. But there were some, some really terrific things about Objective-C. The first uh, is what we call ABI resilience, which is what I described earlier about being able to evolve a library without breaking uh, dependent code. Another important feature it had was that you could actually compile down to object code without requiring a JIT. Again, because power consumption and running on little mobile devices like this watch was important, it was really important not to have to spend energy recompiling code on the device. Third, it interoperates with all of Apple's frameworks. So Apple had built this giant ecosystem of libraries with Objective-C interfaces. And uh, while it was inconsistent, it was the basis on which all software running on Apple platforms stood. So that's a huge advantage. Another important feature, which I didn't really appreciate at first, was that they have this ability to extend types post hoc. In Objective-C, it's called categories. Basically, what it means is you can reopen a type for adding methods at any point, even as a client of it. And at first, especially coming from a C++ background where types are, are quite strictly closed by the authors, this gave me the willies. Um, I started to see the, the benefits uh, eventually, which I'll, I'll talk about. And, and the harms turned out to, to be minimal, if any, um, in my experience. I mentioned this infix notation. Well, here's, here was an example of what they considered expressive method invocation in the Objective-C community. Uh, so you're calling the convert point method on self, and that point colon refers to a point right there, click position, and then it says, you know, convert that point from view, from which view, from my parent. I think there are a few extra words in there, and that actually 
became an issue as swift evolution went down the road. Maybe we'll come back to that. But that infix notation was really important to people. So some goals of Swift. Apple was running all of its software on this language that you know started in 1981 and had been grown sort of by accretion uh, since then. And we really wanted to have a modern language. And that meant you know having a good static typing fitting it into the LLVM ecosystem so that it could benefit from all of the tools and the libraries that were already there. Infinitely hackable was a, was a catchphrase we used basically to refer to the way the compiler was built out of a collection of libraries that would be reusable. And I think there was really a, a goal that it would be really easy to develop new tools and extensions to the language on that basis. I don't necessarily think that it has uh, succeeded completely in that. It's because of technical debt, but that was a goal. We wanted to get rid of a lot of the noise in Objective-C syntax and also make it a lot more familiar to people that were familiar with the common programming idioms. Also, this issue of unification, if you looked at the Objective-C examples I showed you, there's very clearly kind of two dialects going on there at once, and they're, they don't necessarily sit comfortably together. Um, we really wanted to have the sense that there was one thing. What, what ends up happening in Objective-C is that for performance, you end up dropping down to C, and that you start getting away from the object-oriented constructs and start using the raw C constructs. And the feeling of those two things was you know, in marked contrast to each other. Lastly, we wanted Swift to be safe by default. Security was becoming a more and more important thing to Apple. And it was important at least to be able to rule out the completely random behavior that you would get from undefined behavior. Another really important point was that it be evolvable. And that meant that we knew we weren't gonna get it right uh, the first time. And we knew we wouldn't have time to implement all of the things we wanted to in version 1.0. And so it was really important to leave the doors open for the things we knew we would wanna do not close doors prematurely. And a lot of times that meant saying no to doing things that might close off possible futures for us um, because we couldn't anticipate things. And I'll say more about that. Also, uh, it was really a kind of a grand vision. The idea was to make this a language that maybe not in its first iteration, but could be evolved to be great for device drivers and also be great for you know, writing shell scripts or as well as the obvious first application of writing applications for Apple hardware. Interactivity was another important point. The value of having a read eval print loop like Python has was really tangible to us. And even though, you know, I, I know that you can run C++ in a Jupyter notebook, but there must be something different about that than from what we're doing in Swift because uh, we had to go out of our way to design Swift with things like Swift playgrounds in mind. Also, there were some personal agendas at, at work. Doug Greger, who was uh, one of my very good friends, uh, even before I uh, joined the team at Apple, had been working on uh, generic programming support in the language for C++ for many years. And, and after a really Herculean effort, the proposal got shot down at the last minute amid much politics. And he really wanted to realize that vision. And when I say generic programming, I mean generic programming in the sense of the discipline that was invented by Alex Stepanov and Dave Musser which is all about the uh, functions and data, um, believe it or not. It's not about type level programming. 
it's really about algorithms and uh, raising algorithms to their most general form without loss of efficiency. Because generic programming had been my entree into this whole world, that was also very important to me. But I had one additional point on the plate, which I can I can uh, maybe blame Sean for in part, uh, which was having support for value semantics. And I'll say more about what I mean by that in a few slides, but um, it turns out that generic programming actually depends on having value semantics. It's almost impossible to even specify the results of a mutating algorithm if you don't have it. So that's kind of a foundational thing for me. And Chris, Chris had this, this agenda of world domination. And that was the that was the phrase he would use uh, to talk about it, but it really meant something much nicer than that, <laughs> much nicer than it sounds like to all of us, which was, you know, in part that referred to wanting to make a language that could scale from the smallest devices to the to the highest level applications, but also to really building something that was going to make the world better for people and. For me, you know, basically ever since I got involved with this journey, it's been my mission to make the world better for programmers. And so that just rang all of my bells. And uh, as I was making this slide, I, I realized, you know, I had already sort of named half of the key players uh, in the early days of the language design. And so I'm going to uh, show you three others. I don't know that they had such strong personal agendas, but each uh, brought a really unique and important point of view to the to the process. John McCall was our programming language theorist, who you know really had all of the the academic background under his belt. Jordan Rose was a, an extremely young and enthusiastic guy who also was really deeply familiar with the idioms that people had to use to develop for Apple platforms. And so he was a, an, a crucial reality check on all of the decisions that we made. He also ended up being the person who was responsible for the module system and the access control. And lastly, Joe Groff, who another, another super young guy who had already had like more than his his year's worth of, of language experience under his belt. He had worked on, um, I think it was called the factor language uh, before that. Uh, and he he had had exposure to just about every language under the sun. It was amazing. So that ended up being really useful in our discussions of possible design choices. This is another thing that I, I think might be uh, somewhat unique about Swift. From what I've heard, most other language projects really start out as this, you know, very uh, closely owned vision of one person and don't, you know, draw in lots of, lots of ideas from other people. But, um, you know, to Chris's credit, Chris was the, the leader of the, of the project. He really encouraged a, a uh, enthusiastic and vibrant collaboration among all of the people working on the project. And, you know, we argued about a lot of stuff and and had all kinds of disagreements. But I think in the end, we, you know, people sort of dis programming by committee, um, designed by committee. But I, I think that we really came out with better result uh, this way. And that was, frankly, a lot of the experience that I had had working with the C++ committee also is that, is that the input of many voices actually ended up producing a, a better result for the whole community. All right, so what is, what's Swift like? Well, this is the objective C that we saw earlier and this is the corresponding Swift. So you see that it, there's no header file. And I think, you know, it, it follows idioms that are probably a lot more familiar to people that have been exposed to lots of languages. But there is one mistake here that I am only noticing now, 
which is all of the semicolons should be gone. <laughs> so Swift syntax drops the semicolon. That's probably been seen before. So actually, Swift is a lot like Scala. In fact, if you look at the, the middle of this post, it's fair to say that Swift is a dialect of Scala. Swift inherits from Scala most of the banner features listed by Apple, this person said. And while they, they go on to provide some, some caveats to that in the next, the next paragraph, and they also refer to uh, Denise's work over there, this was a very common theme. So uh, you can also find this website, Swift is like Kotlin, and Swift is like C Sharp. And uh, you can also find this website that explains how Swift is like Go. In fact, we, we started to call this a uh, uh, Rorschach language because people started to see the things that they were familiar with in Swift whenever they looked at it. So this is from uh, an interview with Chris Latner on Slashdot. The person asks, how much of Swift was inspired by Groovy? Both come from high-end languages and they look and act almost identical, right? So really, you know, it's a dialect of Scala. It is Groovy. It's practically practically is groovy. No, so it's, you know, the answer is, as Chris says below, it's an intentional design point to make it look familiar to folks coming from lots of other languages. And, you know, that's one of the weaknesses that Objective-C had. Once you were in the ecosystem, if you were really used to Objective-C, you know, you could deal with it more easily than, than anything. But if you'd been exposed to the bulk of languages out there, um, it was really quite different from almost everything. So we were really interested in lowering the barriers to entry. All right, well, I'm not sure what parts to skip. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go quick through this part. Speed and safety, uh, you know, two forces that are often in opposition. How do we deal with that? Well, we wanted Swift to be safe by default. So you know, we also didn't want people to bypass the safety <laughs> if they could avoid it, right? So we designed the safe parts to be optimizable aggressively. Um, and if I get to the value semantics part, I can I can describe one one of those ways. And so we'd also use some use the static type information that we had to optimize away safety checks. But we also made sure that the unsafe facilities were there when you need it so that you wouldn't end up having to bridge into C or objective C in order to get performance. We did this entirely in the library without type system features. So we just have a naming convention. Uh, so unsafe operations and types have unsafe in their name. You know, the beauty of it is that you can build safe components from unsafe parts uh, and of course, since the underlying machine is unsafe, you have to be able to do that if you want any safety at all. One of the, one of the most powerful things that I saw happen in this project was that we said no to quite a few things. This quote at the top from Doug came up when I, I was trying to figure out how to build value semantic arrays in Swift. And you know we didn't have copy constructors or assignment operators. And I was like, well, how am I gonna get independent data? And he, he just said, look, we're not gonna add that, the, all of the complexity of copy constructors, assignment operators, destructors to, to Swift, right? It's not, it, it isn't worth the, the cost. And he made me go back to the drawing board. And fortunately there were answers, but you know, it, it forced a, a novel new look at the, at the problem. There were a number of other things that we said no to. I just want to point to this last one, no string builder. That was something I said we would have over my dead body. So in lots of languages, what you have is an immutable string type, right? And that's to prevent all of the problems associated with shared mutable state. And then you have this other type that can build up the buffer of a string is all, you know, has append operations and whatever and can spit out the immutable string when you're done. But I wasn't gonna have that because 
I was a believer in immutable value semantics. And that meant that we could get all of the benefits of an immutable string and still allow mutation. So let's talk about what that is. So mutable value semantics is the principle that a variable always has an independent value from every other, every other variable, right? So notionally, that means when you do an assignment like A equals B, that copies the value from B to A. And when you call a function, when you pass X by value, it copies X from the caller into the callee. And the callee has an independent copy. This is how your integers work in almost every language. If you think about the way you think about integers, uh, you know, unless you're gonna actually share an integer, there's no race conditions for synchronization. You just pass the integer to a, another thread and it's got a copy. Spooky action at a distance is, a, is an effect where you think you have ownership of something. You think you have the only reference and yet somebody else has another reference and modifies it while you're not looking. Okay, so uh, with apologies to Einstein, it's a typical problem of, of things that don't have value semantics or are shared mutable state. Problems with reentrancy, that, that can come up even when there's no threading, right? Reentrancy happens when you break an invariant as part of a mutation, call out into something, and that thing has a reference to the object whose invariant is broken. Another really hard to diagnose problem in programming. With value semantics, when you compose things, is when you put a thing in another thing, that always means a whole part relationship. And yet, since we're not gonna rule out mutation, you still have in-place mutation for efficiency and for mapping onto cognitive mutating processes. There's a fantastic paper by Melissa O'Neill called The Genuine Civ of Aristosthenes. That's a, it's a Haskell paper where she talks about the difficulty of mapping the actual Civ algorithm onto the immutable constraints of Haskell, also the lazy constraints. You know, if you think about the Civ of Aristosthenes algorithm, you have a bunch of buckets and you go and you check off elements in the buckets. It's inherently mutating. And to translate that into something that, that doesn't do mutation is a mental leap. So two reasons to preserve the ability to mutate. There's a fair amount of precedent for this, but most of the examples other than C++ uh, have been forgotten, I think. C++, the standard, collections all have this property. In Pascal, Pascal arrays have this property. PHP arrays have this property, believe it or not. And in fact, use a similar copy on write optimization to the one I'm gonna describe. And uh, there's also this research language uh, called Wiley, which is a JVM language, which, uh, which also has value semantics. And uh, for a long time, I thought because of garbage collection, because that creates implicit sharing that uh, it would be impossible to have value semantics in a JVM language, but I guess I was wrong. The most naive uh, uh, way to realize value semantics probably is what we have in C++, which is that copies actually get made where they're notionally necessary and they're eager copies. So if we look, we, Here's a C++ example. We've got save to a file, takes a vector of ints. We get the data and we pass it to save to file. Then uh, we have this data, we're gonna sort it and we're gonna print the third element. All right, kind of a stupid algorithm, but it serves the point. Okay, semantically, this is great, right? It, it does exactly what you want, but the problem is nobody does this in C++ because it's inefficient because at the point where you pass the, um, the vector to save to file, it has to be copied. And what that means is allocating a whole new piece of storage, copying all of the data from one place to the other. Okay. What happens in practice is, and this is something that, that Chris 
uh, Latner pointed out to me is that is that C++ has value semantics, but nobody actually uses it. We always bypass it. What we do instead is we pass by const reference. And that's that's a, a proxy for pass by value. But this has this has some other problems. So unfortunately, a reference in C++ is the moral equivalent of a pointer. Well, okay, you know it's not null, but that's not that's not knowing very much. You might have there might be another pointer out there to that thing. So you call a global function or, or any opaque function, and you can't tell that the thing you're referencing hasn't been mutated. Worse yet, save to file can share this pointer it has, right? And so now your uniquely held thing can now become a shared thing behind your back. And the last problem is, so suppose save to file is async. It's going to actually hang on to that reference. And we're going to come back and sort the array. And save to file is going to be trying to access that, that array while we're sorting it. OK, race condition. Lastly, you know, I said this is mutable value semantics. What about mutation? Well, suppose we want to actually write our own function that mutates x directly. Right? So before we were using the standard sort algorithm, that sort of hides the, the indirection. If we're going to uh, mutate x directly, we want to pass it to something. OK, I'm passing it here by pointer. Now we have the same problem. Now my sort doesn't know that it has a unique reference to the thing that Z is pointing at. And my sort can also share Z. We could have used a, a reference for the pointer. It's the moral equivalent. It doesn't, wouldn't change anything except for that we could drop the ampersand on, on the call, okay? So the minute we do mutation, we, we lose all our knowledge about, about value uniqueness in C++. I'm gonna show you the, the answer that Swift has for this. Um, it's called in out. So this is a rewrite of that same code in, in Swift. And you can see bolded in the second line there is the array is passed in out. So what does that mean? I mean, is that just passed by reference? Well, no, it's not, it's not passed by reference because we know we have a unique copy. In fact, from a, a simple point of view as a programmer, you can think of it as you got a copy, you get to work with that copy, and then it gets stuffed back when the call returns into its original place. Now it's not implemented that inefficiently. <laughs> um, normally it's actually a unique mutable borrow, kind of like what you would expect in Rust, but I just want to point out that it doesn't have quite the cognitive overhead of thinking about uh, about a borrow. And mutable borrow is a very referency sounding thing. This is really, you've got the value, you own the value, then the value goes back to where it was. Now, it's actually even a little bit more interesting than that, because when you go through a chain of Access is like this, and then call a mutating function on it. it. There's an inversion of control, and the mutate method ends up called outside of the property access if these subscripts and properties are computed. Um, and that's so that you can do things like uh, setting something up for access and then restoring it on the way back. And sometimes the the thing that you're about to mutate isn't materialized anywhere as an L value, right? So you actually have to build one and allow it, yield it for mutation and then unbuild it, put it back to where, where it goes. So that's the sort of full semantic picture. So that solves the, that solves the mutation problem, but the eagerness problem is still there. So how does Swift deal with that? Well, we couldn't, hook pass by value or assignment to do the data copying. It's not going to have that rule of five programming. And we can't stop the storage from being shared because when things are copied in Swift, there's an implicit bitwise copy plus certain amount of reference counting depending on what the contents of your, your type are. 
the solution was to use the built-in reference counting that we had for, for class types. So if you can count references, you can mutate the unshared data in place that becomes really efficient. If data is shared and you do a mutation, you actually just create new storage for it. Now I say copy on write in, in quotes there because it's not strictly a copy. In order to insert at the beginning of an array, you wouldn't wanna copy the array and then move all of the elements down, right? You just wanna construct the new storage in its final state. And then lastly, if you take this idea of uniqueness checking and make it a first class concept in the library and the language, the underlying language, the language can do things like hoisting uniqueness checks. So if you have a function that's gonna mutate an array you know, repeatedly, it can make the array unique at the top and then get rid of all of the uniqueness checks underneath that. I think I obviously don't have time to, to talk about the Swift timeline other than to blast my way through <laughs> through this and, and say there's been a lot happening. What I did was I, I started popping up these gray boxes for things where there wasn't going to be enough room to, to write it above the, the release mark. And just as a qualitative point, you see that there's this big white space because all of those release points had gray boxes. And what I see when I was on the Swift team, I saw, I always thought that Apple was under investing in development tools because that seems like the biggest lever that they have on the quality of software written for their platform. And what I've been impressed with since I've left is the number of young energetic people, I've seen them hire into those teams and the number of things that they're trying to do. Uh, the latest thing that they rolled out was concurrency, which was a huge effort. And there are all of these other features seem to be in the wings, just ready to go, particularly involved with C++ interoperability. I think I'm gonna call that a wrap. All right, thank you very much, Dave. Um... So uh, we will now move to, to the panel discussion. So I will um, uh, give place for uh, Roman and, and Denise to, to comment, uh, maybe to, to give your impression of, of, what we, uh, of what you've discussed, and, and then we can move on with, uh, with the actual discussion. Yeah, so it, it's interesting that you started with, you know, and the the objective C and um, how, how like disadvantages you wanted to fix. So I'm, I'm curious, like, I mean, from the as an outsider, it's, it's definitely you like inherited lots of good, you know, objective C things that. But looking back, what if uh, like you were designing a language from a clean plate, like you didn't have this like you didn't have to look like start with objective C, like what you've, do you have like anything that you think you've taken from objective C that you shouldn't have been taking it from there? There, there are a couple of things that I, I think are, are really unfortunate. Actually only one thing I think is really super unfortunate that came from objective C, which is the way class initialization works because we had to, uh, stay backward compatible with what Objective C was doing. There are three different categories of initializers. There's delegated, uh, required, and convenience initializers, and there's different kinds of rules for how those get used. Fortunately, you know, I I avoid dealing with that by not using classes because the only thing I use classes for is my implementations of value semantic types. Classes have reference semantics. I'm not interested. So, <laughs> but yeah, for people that have to program with classes, which is anybody that wants to use Apple's frameworks, we have this problem. Interestingly though, I guess one of the patterns that developed uh, around Apple was the idea of a delegate class, which was, I think, designed to bypass a lot of the complexity that comes with deriving from something. So in, instead of deriving from the base class, you you build a delegate and, and that's just got an abstract base and there's nothing to construct. And you talk to the Apple's uh, classes through delegates. So maybe it didn't end up being that much of a, of a problem, but um, it's a lot of complexity in the language. 
there are a couple of other things. There's Objective C protocols um, have something called optional requirements, which, as far as I'm concerned, is just like nonsense on the face of it, right? Um, what's an optional requirement? <laughs> uh, and I wish we didn't have that, but they don't intrude terribly. The other thing that I think was uh, kind of costly was uh, implicitly unwrapped optionals because of the, and that's something that we kind of had to support because the pervasive two-phase initialization patterns that people used. For a long time, the, the cost, there was, there was some cost to bridging Objective-C collections like NS array into Swift and making them appear as regular arrays in Swift. But eventually when Swift was able to be uh, put into the operating system, they started using the Swift representation for the Objective-C arrays. As part of the AVI resilience, you're just able to swap out the representation. And so the whole cost of, of bridging between them mostly evaporated. A similar question I have is um, speaking of um, like Objective-C heritage and you know how would you think this differently? Has there been any discussions on what if we would do garbage collection as memory management instead of having reference counting? Garbage collection was tried uh, and, and failed miserably actually uh, inside of Objective-C. And one of the reasons that it failed was that it, it was almost impossible to build a library that would work both with garbage collection and with the manual reference counting or even the automatic reference counting that many of the applications were using. But the other problem was that garbage collection was shown to have high memory overhead. And for these little constrained devices, that really became a problem. It became a performance problem as well as a, as well as a memory pressure problem. So basically oh. as, uh, just to give a bit of background as someone coming from Scala kind of, uh, ecosystem where everything is reference type and, um, like everything is an object, right? You know, I, it's really almost impossible to escape that. And for Scala, it's like garbage collection is really the only way in comparison because the amount of allocations you do without value types is way, way on a different scale. So um, I think one of the interesting angles of Swift is that maybe Swift didn't suffer so much from reference counting being slow, uh, is that with value semantics, you don't have to allocate on literally every single part of your object, right? Yeah, well, so interesting things about that. Um, one of the things about reference counting being slow, well, so it's an atomic increment, right? And that, that does have uh, a significant cost, but you can use optimization to eliminate extra increments and reason about the lifetime of things. And so that's one of the things the, the optimization pass uh, for Swift was optimized for. Speaking of optimizations, like, and it seems like, you know, Swift has some kind of uh, ideas about ownership inside of the optimizer. Why not surface those ideas to higher level language? Well, I, I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind, but I know that there are plans to surface more sophisticated ideas about uniqueness and ownership, although in Swift, although I, I think, um, I think maybe we don't need as much as as most people think we do i think we can handle all of the cases of non-copyable types um very actually simply without having a sophisticated ownership system so basically to to pass a non-copyable type by value you can just you know since you know you have a unique reference you can just immutably borrow it right effectively pass it by what we call guaranteed um, in Swift already. And that's the way a lot of things are getting passed around by value now anyway. Yeah, so there are plans to handle the, those kinds of types, but they're, but we never got around to doing it yet. <laughs> so I have a question here about value semantics related issue. So, I mean, I'm a disclaimer, I'm not a big Swift programmer, so I'm, I'm, I've studied it extensively, but I haven't, Done any significant amount of code, but I've heard what what's what's happening in some projects with project with that people, I mean basically, because people get taught this philosophy of code based design and you know, they avoid classes. Basically, they use 
reference-based classes. They use structs everywhere. And when they start, their code base started growing, they have, when they start to model their, uh, all their uh, data as structs, uh, and when they start modeling the business data, which can easily have hundreds of fields that can embed it into other structs with hundreds of fields, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this goes like this, this gets results in a big value objects uh, to, I mean, to copy around when, when you want to well, change it. So what's, what's the, what the coping stretches here are. Okay. So that, that's, uh, that's true. If you have no variable size data in, in your entire thing. Right. But right. so just to, just to sort of, um, balance the, the picture, most large things have considerable variable size data. And every time you have variable size data, you do go through an inner indirection and they're sharing until you have to write on one of the copies. So that already reduces that quite a bit. There are techniques for, for explicitly introducing, you know, a, a value semantic box around things. And it's not a very first class concept. I don't think this comes up all that much, despite the fact that people talk about it as a worry. But um, but I have seen, you know, people create these create a value semantic box, and it's not that it's not that hard to to do, and you know, works fairly transparently. Yes, uh, there is a question from the audience from uh, Jake. Do you have uh, thoughts on the goal and progress of Swift world domination? So I guess it was uh, Chris' agenda. Do you think, uh, do you see a path for Swift usage to extend well beyond Apple's platform? Do you see the main roadblocks that prevent wider adoption? That's a really interesting uh, question. Uh, so it, it was a surprise to me to see, but Apple seems to be actually devoting significant manpower to the C++ interoperability problem. And as far as I can tell, that is a major fundamental thing that you need to get beyond Apple platforms because you know there's a built-in motivator for people on Apple platforms to to use it. All of Apple's APIs are published with Swift. The, all of the tools are are supporting Swift. The you know Objective C is kind of withering on the vine at this point, but. Um, for anybody with a, a large existing code base, Swift is is a very attractive idea, but if they've used C plus plus, it's very difficult to get to. So I think that's one thing that that could be a very important uh, important motivator. Swift is uh, extending. You know, it is used on Android and it is used on Linux and. Uh, you know, there is a Windows port. I don't know how many people are using the Windows. Um, so that stuff exists. And, and in fact, the, you know, as soon as we open source Swift and the Linux port came out, um, there was uh, a big movement to start a, a Swift on server working group. And so there's a, there's a substantial community of people using Swift to, to do server programming what it would take to get to the next level i'm not entirely sure i think i think one thing that holds swift back a little bit is apple's uh propensity to control things <laughs> right they they want to they want to keep control over the language and and i think that that it prevents uh you know Swift development communities from growing outside of the Apple ecosystem a little bit. Uh, for example, I think that Swift really needs something like Boost, uh, like an open source peer reviewed library collection that isn't developed under the auspices of, of you know, is somebody on the Swift core team uh, approving of it? There needs to be more organic growth outside of outside of Apple and there needs to be a community around that growth. So I think that would help. Um, maybe uh, a question from myself on on the on the same topic. Um, what's the view of uh, of Swift 
from from the get go toward community uh, involvement. Uh, I I've, I know that uh, I'm a Swift user. Full disclaimer. I know that there is a large um, a community around something called Swift evolution uh, to to improve the language. Uh, what was that part of the of the initial vision? Do you, do you think it will help toward the Chris' goal of world domination? Um, well, absolutely. I think I think uh, you know the Open Swift evolution process is was in fact based on on Boost um, when we were launching it. You know. Doug was asking me, well, how do you, how, how do we make this thing work? And I said, so like, look, there's this model out there that, that really worked for us. And so backing up a little bit, was it part of the original vision? Going open source was always part of uh, Chris's secret agenda, even uh, long before we actually did go open source and going open source at Apple is a non-trivial process <laughs> with their you know, level of secrecy, secrecy and corporate control, right? So, um, so that we got to open source at all was was kind of a miracle, and having an open development community was always part of that plan. Um, but the details of how that works, yeah, that that was all inspired by the way we did Boost. Um, there, there was one. David Unger uh, is here. Yes, two two really? comments from David. From the first, uh, Swift could have been more orthogonal. Was it deliberate for familiarity? That's a good question, but I but I should ask for some examples of how of how he thinks it could be more orthogonal, more orthogonal, so that I know what he's talking about. So maybe we can move on to the to the next question. When when the <laughs> question is being refined, uh, a type difference can lead to exponential compilation times. What would the the best solution be? I don't know if everybody knows, but David at least was on the Swift team not long ago. I, I'm sure he's been thinking about how to deal with the, the compilation time issues from type inference a, a lot more deeply than I. And, and, you know, I can only offer sort of a, a more casual <laughs> cavalier assessment of it, especially because I haven't been working inside the compiler uh, as much, but my sense is that there, have always been places where the bi-directional type inference um, that Swift does was overkill. And we could like, at least for the vast majority of cases, drive sort of type inference in, in one direction from knowns to unknowns. This is my sense as a Swift user. Um, yeah, I'm a fan of fast compilation too. <laughs> Uh, I guess the, um, the refinement for the um, for the orthogonality is um, things like protocol dispatch rules and be the same as class dispatch, sometimes static, sometimes dynamic. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't I don't worry about anything that's not like the way classes work because because classes are beyond the pale from my point of view. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think classes had to work the way they had to work because of because of objective C compatibility and and I don't I don't really worry about that um, a quick follow-up question um, uh, can you discuss um, Swift without classes like what how would it look like if it uh, was just values at least at the unsafe level you need you need references so that you can build things like copy on write data types I'm not about eliminating the possibility of uh, building such things but when I write programs, I use, you know, the only classes I'm using are inside the implementation of, of you know, arrays and, and dictionaries, for example, um, you know, and, and my own little copy on write wrappers or other data structures that I've built. But outside of that, the thing, the things that I use above that level have value semantics. Um, on the topic of uh, performance, you mentioned performance a lot. What, what was the, because I, I know, uh, I've been told that uh, Kotlin has been centered about, uh, uh, around ergonomics rather than, than performance. What is the impact of, um, of ergonomics in, in Swift design space? Uh, how, how much space it took in the discussions uh, as opposed to, to, to preserving performance? I actually don't think that ergonomics works against performance at all. 
at least in Swift. I think there are other things that work against performance. In fact, which uh, I didn't have time to get to, um, the ABI resilience and library evolvability works against performance because whenever you put a generic at the at the library boundary, since we have separate compilation, that means if effectively it gets compiled into dynamic dispatch for each of the protocol requirements that gets used in that generic, right? And so typically when you do generic programming, you have things like, like indices, which are these very lightweight types that, that you're going to go through a, a, a protocol to do, to like move the index one element forward or back. And if that, that call has to dispatch through an indirection, you know, every time you have like an overhead like that, if you do a tiny bit of work behind it, the overhead starts to swamp the work that you're doing. And so that's a place where, where we have a real tension with, with efficiency and it might make sense to look at later compilation, if not just in time, maybe in the, in the app store compilation or something like that to erase some of those, some of those overheads where it's, it's in principle is static dispatch, but the mechanism that has to be used in order to make separate compilation work is a dynamic dispatch. Um, another question from, uh, from David, uh, from the audience, um, what would you change about the tooling to better support Swift? I've never been able to figure out LLDB. It's, it's too complicated. If somebody would make me GDB for, for Swift, I would be a lot happier. Uh, so I, I never end up using, uh, debuggers. Um, uh, I think working on distributed compilation, uh, is an important thing. Um, I know that, uh, you know, Apple has people working in that space, but I don't think they have enough time to actually push it forward. Um, one thing I think <laughs> that would be huge is, uh, is a system for extracting documentation from Swift that, that actually presents generic libraries properly. I believe that Apple just open sourced its, its documentation extractor system. But if, if you're, if you go and you look at the descriptions of the, of their generic components, like from the standard library that get published on the Apple developer website, there are a lot of problems. Um, they leave out conditional conformance information. They repeat the methods that are in common across, across a whole protocol on each concrete type that uses it as though that, as though they were uniquely implemented there. And, and so there's, there's no way to form a, a it's all oriented at using things concretely. <laughs> and, and, and at some point that fails to scale, which is why we have generic programming, right? <laughs> so we don't, we haven't implemented sort separately for each collection because it doesn't scale, right? So don't also wanna think of those as unique entities in the documentation. That's another, that's another problem. I, uh, I just, I feel like, um, Apple's, uh, when we went to put out Swift documentation initially, there was a desire to, and, and I quote, make documentation for the average bear. And that meant taking out like critical information. And I, you know, I fought against that, but I could only, I could only do so much. So I, I think the documentation tools just, just don't do a great job of, of representing what's there. Uh, another question from the audience from uh, Ifaz is asking, um, uh, is commenting the JVM has a nice environment for profiling. What's the profiling story for Swift? The best supported development environment for Swift is Xcode. And, you know, that's like kind of Apple's own business and they, they have some pretty sophisticated profiling tools there. I didn't find the majority used, but, uh, but profiling is hard. <laughs> um, I don't know what the portable profiling uh, story is. I don't know whether you can get a gprof uh, output, for example, on Linux. My impression was that normal tools on Linux uh, that you would use for C++ work for Swift as well. And um, 
as a person who used Swift, I would say is actually, even though it's lower level, if you actually care about performance, um, it's actually easier to get good performance in Swift than uh, in uh, JVM because on JVM you have adaptive VM, which is kind of antagonistic to your actions. So you can optimize something, but it, it would do something different. And it's very hard to to, um, to look at low level enough representation and connect it to the high level code because uh, essentially in Swift, you really can see the code in the compiled code and it would kind of make sense if you know a little bit of assembly or a little bit of the IR that you're looking at. And like in Java, I never had this impression. So I feel like it's better. I can say that Denis has done a, a lot of uh, work on profiling and, uh, and benchmarking, especially wrote a benchmarking library for Swift. He knows of what he speaks. Uh, we we definitely have another JVM expert here. Um, Roman, could you comment, for, for instance, of, uh, on on the profiling experts on JVM and uh, how we it would relate to something lower level? I I mean the the JVM is a huge platform, and uh, the the reason that Kotlin was built on it was was explicitly to to kind of you know to uh, be able to use all the great tools out there. There's I mean. I can't even count how many great profilers are there on GVM on different levels, like from just Java only profilers to the really low level native code, like uh, things like Intel VTune that support like GVM and can understand Kotlin code too. So, I mean, th th again, for Kotlin, that was their reason uh, to, to build this up on top of GVM. One of the just because you can, you have all those great tools around that just work mostly. Sometimes we have to do a report to, to have them work this way. Um, another question from the, the audience here, uh, so they're moving away from the topic of performance. Did all, uh, from, from Ed Sadowitz, sorry for pronunciation, did other language uh, inspire the design of in-out in Swift? Ada, for instance, has value semantics and in-out parameters mode uh, 40 years ago, uh, and later versions of the language have further Develop safe access types for real time and high integrity computing. <laughs> many, many languages inspired Swift, and uh, in out, I believe, was brought to the table by John McCall, and he's uh, he's a extremely well read uh, PL research guy. So I'm sure that he knows a lot of what's out there. It, I would not be at all surprised if if uh, it, that was partly uh, inspired by Ada. But um, you know, it might well have also been inspired by Rust or something. Maybe as uh, as, as a follow up question, we we've been talking about surfacing things. It, it was uh, one of Danny's comments: sur surfacing things from the underlying model of ownership of Swift uh, uh, at the surface uh, level of the of Swift syntax. Do you see an influence from modern or contemporary programming languages like? Obviously, Swift has been inspired by, by many past languages, but maybe Rust uh, or, or Kotlin or, or these languages that are contemporary to Swift, do you, do you think they, they have an impact on Swift's current design and, and steering? Absolutely. I mean, in the sense that, you know, for example, the, the latest big effort from this Swift community was this concurrency work, and they went and looked at all of the other the other contemporary efforts. And so, you know, they know what's going on with Go and they know what's going on with Kotlin and, and C Sharp and they put all of that into their consideration bucket when they were designing this stuff. And, and you know, I've been, I've been pretty hard on the designers of the concurrency stuff for Swift uh, in, because I wanted a more value semantic emphasis than they started with. But, you know, the more I look at it, the the more impressed I am that, <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with my religion, but it, uh, but they seem to have done a really good job with it. So, and, and I think a lot of that comes from knowing what else is out there. Yeah. So like a recent conversation I had with Joe Groff about stackful versus stackless coroutines revealed that like, He's thought about all of the different ways to all the different permutations, and he sees the the ones that are winning and understands like the the reason Swift ended up where it did is because of interoperability with C. But but if you didn't have to interoperate with C, you'd probably make them work like Go does, or Julia, for example. So it, like he's he's on top of those things. 
and he's not the only one. Maybe I have the opportunity to, to, to snap this, this question back to Roman. The, R- Roman, as, as lead of, of Kotlin, do, do you think Swift has any influence on, on Kotlin design or uh, community desires for evolving the language? Oh, definitely. I mean, the desires part is definitely... I mean, it, it's so funny that because I'm, I'm following all the uh, Utrecht issues that people post into language design, and there's also many calls like, please give us a feature like in uh, language X and as language X, we often comes. Uh, uh, and so it definitely does influence. So, I mean, it, it, it doesn't mean like the way languages uh, gets influenced. It's not that, you know, a feature from one language gets added to another, but it's when, you know, some language has a great thing that covers some nice use cases, makes code simpler or enables certain things. And then this kind of, then people start wanting that. They start asking, oh, we want to be able to that too. And that's the language designers start thinking how we can incorporate something that would achieve that into the language. It never gets, you know, ideas never flow very right much from language. So it always get adapted to the philosophical language. But but I see lots of, lots of, uh, like, it's not just Swift Kotlin, it's like all of the place. Like, look how a single way God first appeared in C Sharp and then spread out across the other languages, like lots of them. It's happened all the time. Ideas flow across the programming languages, but they get adapted. Like, a single way, like, gets got tweaked multiple times when it incorporated into different languages. Okay, we have um, uh, maybe one last question from, from the audience. We're almost reaching time here. Um, what has been your biggest surprise, especially you in using Swift, uh, surprise arising from the experience of using Swift versus what you expected when you designed it? Well, one thing that harkens back to the, to the F sharp talk earlier, which I, which I only caught a, a part of was that my perspective on the, on the divide between static and dynamic things uh, was changed a lot by my work with Swift and, and actually programming with it. At some level, because of this resilience, Swift has an underlying underlying dynamic model before before optimization. Right? Optimization like recovers the you know it it sees all the static information and and recovers static dispatch where where dynamic things were and. And it started to make me think about places where you could be assured of. I, I guess I was. I, I guess part of it was that I, I was surprised with with Swift at, at how many places the um, it could recover optimizations that I thought would be lost due to, for example, type erasure. Just just to take an example, closures with captures. The information about what the types and elements that are that are captured in a closure gets erased from the type. But um, there are a lot of contexts where you can use them where, where a big web of, of closures can collapse down to one, just one static, one dynamic dispatch. Um, so uh, I guess that's one thing. All right. I think we are uh, slowly but surely reaching the, the end of the, um, the other time for this session. Um, unless there is a, oh, there is a last minute question. Uh, do you mean you believe a dynamic model could be faster than uh, what you had thought? I guess it's a follow well, from the closure thing. Yeah, I mean, in the sense that when I was just a C++ programmer, I had a pretty rigid idea about what kinds of things could be optimized away and what couldn't. And part of the reason is, uh, I, I believe some of the things that I talked about in the, in the mutable value semantics details where the, the compiler can't actually eliminate the possibility that there are multiple references to things. And therefore, therefore you do lose the ability to optimize things down to static dispatch, but uh, with a slightly stronger 